All right. I think that's a, enough time to let people um, filter in. Some people join a little bit. That's perfectly fine as well. Um, so let's start off by um, thanking everybody that has um, has shown up. I really appreciate everyone attending to listen to our fantastic speaker today. I know I'm, who I will introduce in just a few moments. I am very excited to listen to hear all about what she has to say about this topic. Um, my name is Brett McAllister. I'm the Director of Graduate Admissions for the Hamas College of Arts and Sciences. Um, with me as well um, is Ms. Farah Amro, one of my assistant directors here working with us in the admissions team. Um, more importantly than both of us is the speaker of the hour, which I'm very excited to introduce. Um, this is Ms. Faith Borak. She is a MS candidate for the Biological Sciences. So I'm going to re read her title for today, a brief bio, and then I will turn it over to her. Um, so the title of today's lecture, uh, The Effects of a Changing Environment on Sulfur Cycling in Marine Sponges. Faith Borak is a master's student in the Biological Sciences program, working in Dr. Jose Lopez's Molecular Microbiology Lab. Her interests lie in marine sponge micro microbiomes, especially their contribution to major nutrient cycles. Through her research, Faith explores how increasing temperatures, ocean acidification, and hypoxic events impact sulfur oxidizing and sulfate reducing microbes in the sponge Cynocorilla species. Faith holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Marine Biology from Texas A&M University, Galveston, which is where she initially fell in love with marine invertebrates. After starting her work at NSU, she has taken an increased interest in using genomic techniques to study them. Faith hopes to share her passion for sponges and the role they play in their ecosystems with others. So Faith, well, again, thank you very much for being here and willing to speak to our viewers today. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it on over to you. And at the end, we will have about 10, 15 minutes from a Q&A session, but I'm sure there'll be many questions for you as well. So, All right. Thank you for the introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So my presentation is on the environmental impacts on sulfur metabolizing bacteria in the sponge Cinecarella species. So we're going to start with a bit of background information. Starting with some information on sponges as a whole, or phylum periphera. So periphera is an ancient lineage, and they formed the basal group to all other animals, meaning they were the first animal group to diverge. They are mostly sessile filter feeders, but we do have some exceptions, such as deep sea carnivorous sponges, which actually feed on small crustaceans. They lack differentiated tissues, but they do have specialized cell types. These include collar cells that pump water through the sponge, porocytes, which form the small pores in the sponge that allow water into the sponge itself. We have amoebocytes, which play roles in digestion, nutrient absorption, and reproduction. And these sclerocytes, which form the spicule skeleton of the sponge. They are also an incredibly diverse phylum with four distinct classes and about 8,550 species. For comparison, class mammalia, which is the class that we're in, only has about six to 7,000 known species. And then here we have a figure of some basic sponge anatomy. So the osculum is the exit through which water actually exits the sponge. Water comes in through those pores, out through the osculum, and is organized in by specialized cell types. On the inside of the sponge, you can see the collar cells which have a specialized flagellum to actually pump the water through the sponge. And on this slide, I just have some examples of each of the four classes of sponges, just to give a little screenshot of their diversity. So first is class Dimospongiae. Dimospongiae is a calcareous sponge, so it has, or not calcareous, a siliceous sponge. So it has spicules made out of silica, and that is the group we're going to be focusing on today. Class calcarea is our calcareous sponges, so they have spicules that are made of calcium. Class hexactinolita is our glass sponges. They're primarily found in the deep sea. They have siliceous spicules, but they have a bit of a different skeleton structure from our other classes. And then class homosclerimorpha, which are primarily differentiated from the other classes by their unique spicule shapes. So marine sponges are a pretty important group, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the ecological roles that they play. This includes habitat. So sponges can form reefs, and individual sponges can also house small invertebrates, providing lots of habitat. 
they are a food source. They support spongivorous organisms. So there's plenty of organisms that feed almost exclusively on sponges. They play an important role in water quality. A one kilogram sponge can filter up to 24,000 liters of water in a day. And they play important roles in nutrient cycling. So the sponge loop, which is the process that is pictured in this diagram here, is the process by which sponges convert dissolved organic carbon into particulate organic carbon. And this is extremely important on nutrient poor coral reefs because they're taking this dissolved organic carbon, which most other organisms can't really use, and they're essentially converting it into a form that can actually be used by other organisms, generally in the form of cells that they're shedding as they grow. And then these sponge cells are going to help feed the rest of that ecosystem. In addition to the sponge loop, sponges do have a microbiome that contains sulfur, nitrogen, carbon, and phosphorus metabolizers, all of which play roles in these for nutrient cycles. So the sponge microbiome is made up of extremely diverse communities. You have many bacteria that are sponge-specific symbionts, such as our porobacteria, but we also have some that are a little bit more transient. And these microbiomes play pretty important roles in nutrient cycling, as was briefly mentioned before. But for instance, in the carbon cycle, we have cyanobacterial symbionts. In the sulfur cycle, we have sulfur oxidizing and sulfate reducing bacteria, which is what our focus is on today. The nitrogen cycle, we have nitrogen fixation by our bacterial symbionts. And in the phosphor cycle, there's some evidence for redox reactions that produce polyphosphate, but this is a process that is extremely understudied. So the role that these microbiomes are playing in the phosphor cycle is still very poorly understood. And sponges are categorized based on the number of microbes present within the sponge itself. So you have high microbial abundance and low microbial abundance sponges. The diagram to the right is an example of the metabolic process that these microbes are going through in a high microbial abundance sponge. So you're taking up some of the metabolic waste that the sponge is creating, using that to fuel a number of different metabolic processes in the sponge. We have processes of carbon fixation, denitrification, and nitrification, so on and so forth happening within the sponge microbiome. And I want to talk a little bit about high microbial abundance versus low microbial abundance sponges. So high microbial abundance sponges have a huge number of symbionts that make up roughly 25% or more of their biomass and up to 75% of their dissolved organic matter. So essentially their carbon intake is coming from these symbionts. Whereas low microbial abundances, the symbionts are making up less than 0.5% of their biomass. So really, it's not much higher of a concentration than the surrounding seawater, and they make up very little of the uptake of dissolved organic matter. So now I want to talk a little bit about sponge respiration, as well as anaerobic pockets that form in the sponges. So sponges naturally do have some anoxic toxics pockets within their tissue, so the oxygen concentrations in these pockets are very low, and this allows for their anaerobic symbionts to thrive. Um, the concentrations of oxygen in these pockets are impacted by the sponge pumping rates, so essentially the more they pump, the more oxygenated the sponge will be, and the less they pump, the less oxygenated the sponge tissue will be. So some sponges actually can use this and shift their microbiome composition through their pumping rates, so aplicinia, for example, can shift between aerobic and anaerobic microbial metabolism just by shifting its pumping rate. So it'll slow down its pumping rate when it needs to utilize more of the anaerobic microbial metabolism and increase the pumping rates when it needs more of that aerobic metabolism. Now, the exact role of anaerobic metabolism in the sponge is still somewhat poorly understood in terms of how it impacts their survival. And I did want to share this brief clip here, which shows a little bit of how sponges actually pump. Coming up next on Jonathan Burns Blue World, Jonathan explores the biology of sponges, and you might be surprised at what he finds. Hi. Yeah. 
So that was just a brief clip. They're inserting a fluorescent dye into the water surrounding the sponge. And the sponge is uptaking, uptaking that dye and pumping it through its osculum. So that just gives you an idea of kind of how they pump water. I'm Jonathan! So, Cinecrella species is the genus that I'm focusing on, and we use it as a model in the Lopez lab. It is a common genus of marine sponges. We have three species that are native to South Florida, and it is considered a high microbial abundant sponge. We use it as a model species for a few reasons. Um, for one, the microbiome and transcriptome have been characterized by previous um, people in our lab. So some of our alumni, Eliza, Shelby, Yvonne, have previously characterized a lot of this in Cinecrella. And it's also been used to model the effect of oil spills on rain sponges by Yvonne. So we use it because it's easy to culture and keep alive. We have a wealth of previous studies in literature, both within and outside of our lab and it is common and easy to collect. So for example, this is one of our previous graduate students from our lab, Yvonne, and he ran an experiment in, with uh, Cinecarella cucantheli, looking at the transcriptome sequences. So he sequenced the transcriptome and also looked at the impact that oral spills have on the transcriptome of the sponge. So next I want to talk about some of the impacts of environmental changes on the sponge microbiome that we already know from previous research. Starting with hypoxia, we're seeing increased incidences of hypoxic events due to eutrophication, which is the entry of nutrients into our waterways. This causes algae blooms, and when these algae die off, they are decomposing and this de decomp decomposition uses up the oxygen in the water column, causing a hypoxic zone. Sponges actually have very high tolerance to these hypoxic zones, and they can adapt through both behavioral and morphological changes. So these behavioral changes can include changes to their expansion and pumping rates, whereas morphological changes include modifications to their osculum and their papillae. And sponge microbiomes do also contain anaerobic bacteria. So as we mentioned previously, some sponges can shift the metabolism of their microbiome by adjusting pumping rates. And the question here is, are these anaerobic symbionts contributing to sponge survival in these anoxic events? And it's theorized that they might be playing a role in this, but it's somewhat unknown. So on the right here, this figure is basically showing some of the impacts that hypoxia have on the morphology and pumping rates of these two sponge species. So in red, we have our treatment. So this is the sponge that's being exposed to low oxygen. And in the blue, we have our control. And we can see, especially when it comes to the uh, sponge papillae, the expansion ratio in the um, experiment two, as well as the uh, pumping rate, we can see there is definitely a difference there between the control and the experimental conditions. So these sponges are changing their morphology in order to survive these events. So next, the effects of extreme heat. I'm sure that we have all seen the increase of extreme heat events in recent years. Last summer, we had that pretty severe heat um, heat events. So sponges are actually highly heat tolerant. So unlike corals, many can survive these acute heat exposures and larvae as sponges have a similar tolerance. Because of this, they're expected to dominate future reefs as these heat events are killing off our hard corals and other reef organisms. However, temperate and cold water sponges are less tolerant to these extreme heat events than tropical sponges are. The microbiome of sponges are also very re resilient to moderate temperature increases, but shifts can start to occur when we start to see acute increases, and it can affect the diversity measures of the microbiome. The figure I have to the right here is showing the um, diversity measures of the sponge uh, microbiome under four different conditions. 
Um, we're going to focus on the CT, H HST, and EHST. The CT is the control, HST is heat exposure, and EHST is the extreme heat exposure. So for most of our diversity measures, um, we can sometimes see a bit of an increase in moderate heat exposure in diversity, but that diversity will then drop as we enter an extreme heat event. And finally, effects of ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is a reduction in pH caused by the uptake of carbon dioxide in the ocean. So we know that the, our oceans are one of our biggest carbon sinks, and basically carbon dioxide in the atmosphere enters the ocean and is converted into um, carboxylic acid. The problem with this is this carboxylic acid can cause impacts on many calcifying organisms as it reacts with the calcium in the water that these organisms need in order to build their skeletons or their shells. Um, sponges, however, show very high resilience to acidification. So even calcifying sponges are able to synthesize spicules under acidic conditions. Some sponges even show increased growth rates. And we do see a shift in sponge communities in acidic conditions versus not acidic. The microbiome also experiences a shift. So we see significantly different community composition as well as a shift in metabolic potential. Uh, sulfur assimilation rates actually are reduced, and this may also impact sponge survival. So here on in this figure, this is showing the difference in metabolic processes between a seep that is very acidic and a control in a less acidic environment. So we see that there's quite a significant difference between which processes are enriched in a, an acidic seep versus a control. So it definitely changes the uh, microbial metabolism quite a bit. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about the sulfur metabolism and the sulfur cycle. The sulfur cycle is the movement of sulfur through biological and geological reservoirs, such as the soil, water, atmosphere, and as well as living plants and animals. Sulfur oxidation and sulfate reduction are the processes that we're primarily going to be focusing on. These are coupled processes that are facilitated by bacteria, and I have them boxed in this figure here. So here's where we have our bacterial oxidation and our bacterial reduction occurring. Sulfate reduction is the conversion of sulfate to sulfide. And there are a handful of genes involved in this process, including the SAT gene, APRAB, DSRAB, and paradoxin genes. So here on the right, we have a figure showing the sulfate reduction pathway. And we can see the SAT gene, APR gene, and DSR gene are all playing a role in the conversion of sulfate into sulfide. Sulfur oxidation is a little bit more of a complex process with a lot more steps because we have more intermediaries. So sulfur oxidation is the conversion of sulfide and elemental sulfur into sulfite and other derivatives. Sulfur oxidation genes are somewhat dependent on the pathway, whether you're converting sulfide to elemental sulfur, sulfur to sulfite, sulfite to thiosulfate, or thiosulfate to tetrathionate. But there are some common gene pathways, including the SOX pathway, which is one of the most widely found in sulfur oxidizers, as well as the DSR, SAT, and APR pathways that are also involved in sulfate reduction. In the figure at the right here, we can see the entire process of sulfur oxidation, and we can see a lot of our genes previously mentioned. So the SOX genes up at that top right the DSR system, APR system, and SAT genes all in the bottom of the figure as well. So we have two primary types of bacteria that metabolize sulfur, and this is our sulfate reducing bacteria and our sulfur oxidizing bacteria. In sulfate reducing bacteria, they undergo that process of sulfate reduction that we talked about a couple slides back, 
The bacteria are primarily anaerobic. They use sulfate as a terminal electron acceptor in their metabolic processes, and most can actually reduce other sulfur compounds, not exclusively sulfate. Sulfur oxidizing bacteria can be aerobic or anaerobic, depending on the bacteria, and most are autotrophs that use sulfur compounds as electric donors in carbon fixation. Uh, so many of them are also photosynthesizers, so they are generating their own energy and using these sulfur compounds in their process as these electron donors. So now I'm going to get into my experimental goals and methods, starting with my questions and hypotheses. So I want to know, does the microbiome of Cinecrel species contain genes involved in sulfur metabolism? So I think the Cinecrella species microbiome will contain sulfur oxidizing and sulfate reducing microorganisms, and that transcripts for these genes involved in sulfur metabolism will be present within the sponge. I also want to know how different environmental conditions impact the sulfur metabolism of the sponge symbionts, and will transcription of these genes increase or decrease under these different conditions? So I want to look at if the number of transcripts for the sulfur redu sulfate reduction and sulfur oxidation genes are going to increase under hypoxic conditions since they're anaerobic bacteria. Will the number of transcripts not change significantly under heat exposure since we know that the sponge microbiome can be quite stable even in the heat? And I think they will may decrease under acidic conditions due to the previous study mentioned where they did find a decrease in sulfur assimilation rates in acidic conditions. So this is a basic diagram of my methods. Uh, the first step is collecting and culturing the sponge. The next step is if we're setting up the actual experiments, performing DNA and RNA extractions, using that DNA and RNA to undergo qPCR and 16S amplicon microbiome sequencing, and then analyzing my data. So for collection and culturing, sponges will be collected via free diving and kept in natural seawater. For the experimental setup, the heat experiment has actually already been run. Specimens have been obtained from a previous experiment by Cara Fiore. She was actually down in South Florida a while back and ran a heat experiment wanting to look at some um, wanting to look, filter some water from these heat experiments, and I kept the actual sponges to use in my experiment. For the acidification experiment, the pH of the tank will be lowered using hydrochloric acid and combining it with either NaHCO3 or Na2CO3. And for the anoxic conditions, the tank will be sealed to limit the air entering the system and create an anoxic environment. DNA and RNA extractions will be performed using the Zymobionics DNA and RNA MagBeat kit, and the squeeze method will be used to extract DNA from sponges. It is a method that we commonly use in the Lopez lab to extract DNA from sponges, and basically involves squeezing the sponge tissue to separate the actual cells from the spicule skeleton to get a better extraction. And this picture on the right, I have some center call species specimens in the tank set up from the heat experiment. This picture was taken last year. The next step, once I have my DNA and RNA, is to do 16S gene amplicon sequencing. We follow the Earth Microbiome Project methods in our lab. PCR is used to amplify the 515-806 region of the 16S rRNA gene. This is a gene that is highly conserved across prokaryotes, but just differentiated enough where we can tell the difference between different orders, families, and sometimes down to the genus level of the prokaryotes, prokaryotes present. Unique barcodes are used for each sample so that when we run it through the sequencer, we can actually differentiate which sample is which during our analysis. And our initial analysis is run on CHIME2 in command line to the right. I have an example of some CHIME2 code that is pretty standard to what we use in the lab. 
So we, we use Chime 2 to demultiplex quality filter and identify taxonomy. Demultiplexing essentially separates out the samples using those barcodes that we mentioned earlier. Quality filtering makes sure that all of our sequences are high enough quality for further analysis. And then identifying the taxonomy, we use the Silva database in order to determine the taxonomy of each individual sequence. And then qPCR allows for the quantification of the sequence using special fluorescent dyes. So basically, like a regular PCR, you are amplifying the gene that you're targeting. But because of this specialized dye, we're able to actually quantify how much of that gene was present before it started replicating. It can be used for DNA or RNA transcripts. And I will be using custom primers to target RNA transcripts of the genes specifically involved in cell metabolism in order to answer the question if the quantity of these transcripts is going to change depending on the experimental condition. And to the right, we have a basic qPCR workflow. So taking our reagents and our dyes, uh, running it with our DNA through the real-time PCR instrument, and then analyzing using an analysis software. So for data analysis, 16S sequence data is going to be analyzed in R after that initial time analysis. Um, we typically in our lab use packages PhiloSeq, Vegan, Microbiome, and ggplot2 in order to generate our figures and look at stats. We generate stacked bar charts, NMDS plots, and diversity measures. And we can compare through statistical tests um, whether there's a difference between our experimental conditions and our control. 16S data we can also use to identify potential sulfur metabolizers in the microbiome. Although 16S data will not identify down to the species level, we can get some identifications down to the family or genus level that can give us an idea of if we might have some sulfur metabolizers there. And then qPCR data will be analyzed in R and or Python. So figures will be generated using auto qPCR in Python or an equivalent R package. And then we're going to compare the transcript quantity for each gene between the experimental conditions and control. To the right, I have a figure that is an example of figures that can be generated using the auto qPCR app. Um, so we see all these figures are essentially comparing the relative quantity of these transcripts to look at the effects of different experimental conditions. So here I have an example of 16S analysis that I've done previously in our lab. This is using sediment sequence data from the Port Everglades, but this just gives a good idea of what some of those figures I'll be generating will end up looking like. So this graph shows the top 20 orders in my sediment sample here, and you can kind of see the difference between the different samples and sample sites in terms of the community composition. This is an example of diversity measure box plots using that same set of data differentiated by sample. So it shows how different the diversity measures actually, the four major diversity measures we're looking at are between each of our samples. So we have species richness, evenness, chain of diversity index, and inverse Simpson diversity index. And this is an example of an NDS plot in an NDS plot, we're essentially looking for clustering. So we're looking for which samples are the most similar to one another and which ones are the least similar. So we see that the um, those purple and those red samples to the left there are clustered pretty closely together and probably have a pretty similar microbiome. We have some clustering of this dark blue up here. And then we see that the other sites aren't necessarily super different from one another. They're all kind of clustered in the same general area of the graph. So now I'm going to go into some of my preliminary data and results. The first bit of preliminary data I looked at was a Cinecrella species metagenome that has previously been characterized by one of our alumni, Eliza Shmakova. 
So she has characterized the metagenome of Cinecrella and found multiple mags or metagenomically annotated genomes that were involved in sulfur metabolism. So each of these mags is essentially an individual species that she found in the genome and that she sequenced. And then Shelby Kane has also identified potential sulfur metabolizers in her 16S sequencing data that was also done in our lab. So we can see on the diagram to the right, this is actually from Eliza's thesis. And in the boxes, I have put the sulfur um, metabolizing genes, so the SAT gene, the SOX complex, DSRAB, and APRAB genes were all found within her metagenomes. So I took these mags and I brought them over into Kbase which is an online server-based bioinformatics tool that is good for microbiome and bacterial genome analysis. I used the three mags I used are sulfur vistus variabilis, disulfur bacterium autotrophicum, and theoalcovibrio sulfidophilus. And I annotated these genomes to look at the sulfate reduction pathway genes. So in these mags, I found the SAT gene, APRA and APRB, a couple of the DSR genes, as well as some various ferrodoxins. I also looked at a couple of other sponge metagenomes from the previous literature. This includes the metagenome of Rosinia species and Theonella swinhoi. I downloaded the SRA files from NCBI, and again, the analysis was through Kbase. And I found multiple sulfur metabolizing genes present in these metagenomes, including the SAT gene, APRA gene, and the SOX complex. And I also looked at the metabolic pathways present in these metagenomes, which is what the figure to the right is. This is a sulfur me metabolic model from the Vianella genome, metagenome generated in Kbase using data from KEG. And finally, I started actually designing my primers for qPCR. Once I found these genes, I was able to do multiple protein alignments with them to look for areas of, that were highly conserved. Um, so I used multiple gene sequences from Arsenicrella species max, as well as other sponge metagenomes. And I used BLAST, Mega, and MACT to do these alignments. This particular example is a Mega protein alignment for the SAT gene. And I also did multiple nucleotide alignments using the same tools as above. And I found the regions in my nucleotide alignments corresponding to the protein regions that are most conserved. This is an example of a mapped alignment for that same SAT gene. And finally, once I had those alignments, I was able to actually start designing my primers. So primers were designed based off of both the protein and the nucleotide alignments by first finding the highly conserved regions in the protein and then finding the corresponding nucleotide sequence within the nucleotide alignment. And some degeneracy was included in primers to ensure the best chance of amplification because not every single nucleotide in the sequence always matches up between all of the sequences that I'm looking at. So I needed to have some degeneracy in there to make sure that it would be able to amplify all of those sequences. So for example, taking this protein sequence, I translated it into a nucleotide sequence, found the region and the corresponding nucleotide alignment that it corresponded to. And then from that nucleotide alignment, I was able to design my actual primer sequence, making sure to end on the second coat first or second codon rather than the third codon um, to allow for the best chance of amplification and also including some degeneracy in there. So those ins and Ys in that primer sequence are stand-ins for a nucleotide. And when the primer is designed, essentially some of each of the nucleotides represented by that N or that Y will be included in that primer.
these are my candidate sulfur gene primers. So I have um, primers designed for the SAT, DSRE, and DSRF genes. They were all designed using the same process mentioned previously. And here I have the primer, the gene it correlates to, the protein sequence of that primer, and then the nucleotide sequence of the primer. So I've actually received my gene, my primers for the SAT and DSRF genes, and I went through the process of testing them in a gradient PCR. So a gradient PCR includes multiple annealing temperatures in a gradient from top to bottom to determine the best annealing temperature at which primers are going to amplify. And it also helps ensure um, the best chances of amplification, amplification occurring for a primer that you don't necessarily know the annealing temperature for. So in the results of this experiment, um, I found, sadly, I uh, did not get any amplification from my design primers. Um, I do have some bands here that are my 16S control that I was using to ensure that the PCR would work and that the DNA was good. But sadly, none of my actual primers amplified, so we're kind of back to square one on primer design, which leads me to my next steps. So I'm going to be designing new primer sets, adding more degeneracy to my prior design primers, finding additional candidate genes for primer design, and then collecting sponges to actually run my experiment, which will run for a week, and sponges will be flash frozen afterwards in order to preserve their RNA. And finally, I can start doing my 16S sequencing and qPCR once my experiments are run, analyzing the effects of the experiment conditions on both the microbiome and on the sulfur metabolism gene expression. All right, so thank you very much for listening. I can take questions. Hey, thank you very much for speaking to us this evening. Um, if there are any questions, please put them in the chat before I get to mine. Well, I'll get it started just in case anybody else wants to think about it a little bit further. Um, so I have a you know a couple of more broader questions. Um, have you been able to do much travel? Ooh, there is one coming in from a faculty in just a moment. Um, have you been able to do any much travel? I know you mentioned some of your you know previous field of work that were able to go to some places. Have you had a chance to do anything like that? And do you plan to? Um, well, because I'm looking at a genus that's common to South Florida, I won't really be traveling for my thesis. Um, my sponges will be collected here locally, and my experiments will all be run in um, in house in Dr. Lopez's lab. So, awesome. Um, we do have a question. So, uh, it sounds like sponges are well adapted to tolerate the changing ocean conditions we are currently experiencing due to warming, pollution, etc. Any idea why? Is this an evolutionary adaptation that came from the conditions in the past? So part of it is likely due to the diversity of the phylum. They are incredibly widespread. They are adapted to a lot of different environments. Um, you have sponges ranging from our shallow tropical waters all the way to deep sea. They also, they're going to be less sensitive than corals due to the nature of their symbioses with their microbiome. So corals are very dependent upon their algal symbionts. And that's really what happens when corals are bleaching is those algal symbionts are getting stressed out and leaving the coral. But sponges don't necessarily have that same sort of symbiotic relationship. And their microbiomes are much more hardy and able to adapt to these changing conditions. Now, as I mentioned, this isn't universal across all sponges, especially when it comes to these heat events. Uh, we see this mainly being an adaptation in our tropical sponges that are maybe more accustomed to seeing extreme heat. Our cold water sponges are a lot less resilient to this. 
Awesome. Approximately how long uh, did the primer design process take? So it's not necessarily a long process so much as it is a tedious one. Uh, really, the hardest part was learning the process so that I could then start. Um, but after I kind of got the ball rolling, I was able to work on it over the course of about a week and get those primer sets designed and ready to be ordered. What role do you think sponges play in reducing climate damage on coral reefs? So, as I mentioned previously, they do play important roles on nutrient cycling on reefs, which can help make the reef as a whole a bit more resilient. But since sponges themselves are so resilient, um, it's likely we'll see a shift from those coral reefs to more sponge-based reefs. Uh, we're not sure, obviously we don't know yet exactly what impact that's going to have on the entire ecosystem there, um, but likely we'll, we will see some massive ecosystem shifts as we see this um, shift to a more sponge-based reef because it's a bit of a different habitat structure, different substrate. Sponges are soft-bodied, whereas our hard corals are, of course, hard-bodied, so that's definitely going to cause some impacts. How did you start um, working with the faculty member? How did you get to that decision? I'm sorry? How did you start working with the faculty member you chose? How did that process work for you? So when I started looking at grad schools and undergrad, I basically looked at specifically labs that are working with marine invertebrates because that's what, where my interest was. I found Dr. Lopez's lab at Nova and basically started emailing with him and eventually had a couple of FaceTime meetings and he had space in his lab for a master's student. So I went ahead and applied, got into Nova and came here. Um, when I um, first started, he, we were tentatively thinking about a soft core project, but then he was like, hey, what about sponges? And um, that's how I ended up doing the project I'm doing now. Awesome, thank you for that. But I do want to make sure that I'm cognizant of your time, Faith. I'm sure you're very busy right now with everything kind of wrapping up for this semester. Um, if there are not any last minute questions coming in, I want to make sure, like I said, that you get to you know go back to studying and everything. Um, so for those of you that have viewed this evening, thank you very much for being here. And those of you that are viewing later on our YouTube channel and our social media, um, thank you for watching there as well. This was fascinating, Faith, to listen to. Oh, I do have one more question coming in. Thank you very much. Um, so exciting to see that sponges as filters for different microbes and how they can change based on environmental influences. The anaerobe and aerobes uh, and the influence of sponge pumping is very intriguing. Uh, very interesting. Oh, I guess that was just more of a thank you and a comment. <laughs> So like I said, thank you all for being here very, very much for this question. Um, and thank you for being here with us this evening. We look forward to seeing you around campus, Faith. And I hope everybody has a great night and uh, enjoys the rest of their week. Take care, everyone. Thanks again.